Chapter 58 General Pershing's Own Story Footnote, from General Pershing's Official Report to the Secretary of War November 20, 1918 Immediately upon receiving my orders I selected a small staff and proceeded to Europe in order to become familiar with conditions at the earliest possible moment. The warmth of our reception in England and France was only equaled by the readiness of the commanders-in-chief of the veteran armies of the Allies and their staffs to place their experience at our disposal. In consultation with them the most effective means of cooperation of effort was considered. With French and British armies at their maximum strength, and all efforts to dispossess the enemy from his firmly entrenched positions in Belgium and France failed. It was necessary to plan for an American force adequate to turn the scale in favor of the Allies. Taking account of the strength of the Central Powers at that time, the immensity of the problem which confronted us could hardly be overestimated. The first requisite being an organization that could give intelligent direction to effort, the formation of a general staff occupied my early attention. General Staff A well-organized general staff through which the commander exercises his functions is essential to a successful modern army. However capable our division, our battalion, and our companies as such, success would be impossible without thoroughly coordinated endeavor. A general staff broadly organized and trained for war had not hitherto existed in our army. Under the commander-in-chief, this staff must carry out the policy and direct the details of administration, supply, preparation, and operations of the army as a whole, with all special branches and bureaus subject to its control. As models to aid us we had the veteran French general staff and the experience of the British who had similarly formed an organization to meet the demands of a great army. By selecting from each the features best adapted to our basic organization, and fortified by our own early experience in the war, the development of our great general staff system was completed. The general staff is naturally divided into five groups, each with its chief who is an assistant to the chief of the general staff. G. One is in charge of organization and equipment of troops, replacements, tonnage, priority of overseas shipment, the auxiliary welfare association and cognate subjects, G. Two has censorship, enemy intelligence, gathering and disseminating information, preparation of maps, and all similar subjects, G-3 is charged with all strategic studies and plans, movement of troops, and the supervision of combat operations, G-4 coordinates important questions of supply, construction, transport arrangements for combat, and of the operations of the service of supply, and of hospitalization and the evacuation of the sick and wounded, G-5 Five supervises the various schools and has general direction and coordination of education and training. The first chief of staff was Colonel, now Majgen. James G. Harbord, who was succeeded in March, 1918, by Majgen James W. McAndrew. To these officers, to the deputy chief of staff, and to the assistant chiefs of staff, who, as heads of sections, aided them. Great credit is due for the results obtained not only in perfecting the general staff organization but in applying correct principles to the multiplicity of problems that have arisen. Organization and Training After a thorough consideration of Allied organizations it was decided that our combat division should consist of four regiments of infantry of 3,000 men. With three battalions to regiment and four companies of 250 men each to a battalion, and of an artillery brigade of three regiments, a machine gun battalion, an engineer regiment, a trench mortar battery, a signal battalion, wagon trains, and the headquarters staffs and military police. These, with medical and other units, made a total of over 28,000 men, or practically double the size of a French or German division. Each corps would normally consist of six divisions, for combat and one depot and one replacement division, and also two regiments of cavalry, and each army of from three to five corps. With four divisions fully trained, a corps could take over an American sector with two divisions in line and two in reserve, with the depot and replacement divisions prepared to fill the gaps in the ranks. Our purpose was to prepare an integral American force, which should be able to take the offensive in every respect. 
Accordingly, the development of a self-reliant infantry by thorough drill in the use of the rifle and in the tactics of open warfare was always uppermost. The plan of training after arrival in France allowed a division one month for acclimatization and instruction in small units from battalions down, a second month in quiet trench sectors by battalion. And a third month after it came out of the trenches and it should be trained as a complete division in war of movement. Artillery, airplanes, and tanks. Our entry into the war found us with few of the auxiliaries necessary for its conduct in the modern sense. Among our most important deficiencies in material were artillery, aviation, and tanks. In order to meet our requirements as rapidly as possible, we accepted the offer of the French government to provide us with the necessary artillery equipment of 75s, 155mm howitzers, and 155 GPF guns from their own factories for 30 divisions. The wisdom of this course is fully demonstrated by the fact that, although we soon began the manufacture of these classes of guns at home. There were no guns of the calibers mentioned manufactured in America on our front at the date the armistice was signed. The only guns of these types produced at home thus far received in France are 109 75mm guns. In aviation we were in the same situation, and here again the French government came to our aid until our own aviation program should be underway. We obtained from the French the necessary planes for training our personnel, and they have provided us with a total of 2,676 pursuit, observation, and bombing planes. The first airplanes received from home arrived in May, and altogether we have received 1,379. The first American squadron completely equipped by American production, including airplanes, crossed the German lines on August 7, 1918. As to tanks, we were also compelled to rely upon the French. Here, however, we were less fortunate, for the reason that the French production could barely meet the requirements of their own armies. It should be fully realized that the French government has always taken a most liberal attitude and has been most anxious to give us every possible assistance in meeting our deficiencies in these as well as in other respects. Our dependence upon France for artillery, aviation, and tanks was, of course, due to the fact that our industries had not been exclusively devoted to military production. All credit is due our own manufacturers for their efforts to meet our requirements, as at the time the armistice was signed we were able to look forward to the early supply of practically all our necessities from our own factories. The welfare of the troops touches my responsibility, as commander-in-chief to the mothers and fathers and kindred of the men who came to France in the impressionable period of youth. They could not have the privilege accorded European soldiers during their periods of leave of visiting their families and renewing their home ties. Fully realizing that the standard of conduct that should be established for them must have a permanent influence in their lives and on the character of their future citizenship, the Red Cross, the Young Men's Christian Association, Knights of Columbus, the Salvation Army, and the Jewish Welfare Board, as auxiliaries in this work, were encouraged in every possible way. The fact that our soldiers, in a land of different customs and language, have borne themselves in a manner in keeping with the cause for which they fought, is due not only to the efforts in their behalf but much more to other high ideals. Their discipline, and their innate sense of self-respect. It should be recorded, however, that the members of these welfare societies have been untiring in their desire to be of real service to our officers and men. The patriotic devotion of these representative men and women has given a new significance to the Golden Rule, and we owe to them a debt of gratitude that can never be repaid. Combat Operations During our periods of training in the trenches some of our divisions had engaged the enemy in local combats, the most important of which was Psychopri by the 26th on April 20th, in the tool sector. But none had participated in action as a unit. The 1st Division, which had passed through the preliminary stages of training, had gone to the trenches for its first period of instruction at the end of October and by March 21, when the German offensive in Picardy began. We had four divisions with experience in the trenches, all of which were equal to any demands of battle action. The crisis which this offensive developed was such that our occupation of an American sector must be postponed. On March 28 I placed at the disposal of Marshal Foch, 
who had been agreed upon as commander-in-chief of the Allied armies, all of our forces to be used as he might decide. At his request the 1st Division was transferred from the Tool Sector to a position in reserve at Chamont and Vexen. As German superiority in numbers required prompt action. An agreement was reached at the Abbeville Conference of the Allied Premiers and Commanders and myself on May 2d by which British shipping was to transport 10 American divisions to the British Army area, where they were to be trained and equipped. An additional British shipping was to be provided for as many divisions as possible for use elsewhere. On April 26 the 1st Division had gone into the line in the Montdidier salient on the Picardy battlefront. Tactics had been suddenly revolutionized to those of open warfare, and our men, confident of the results of their training, were eager for the test. On the morning of May 28 this division attacked the commanding German position in its front, taking with splendid dash the town of Cantigny and all other objectives, which were organized and held steadfastly against vicious counterattacks and galling artillery fire. Although local, this brilliant action had an electrical effect, as it demonstrated our fighting qualities under extreme battle conditions, and also that the enemy's troops were not altogether invincible. The German Zane offensive, which began on May 27, had advanced rapidly toward the River Marne and Paris, and the Allies faced a crisis equally as grave as that of the Picardy offensive in March. Again every available man was placed at Marshal Foch's disposal, and the 3rd Division, which had just come from its preliminary training in the trenches, was hurried to the Marne. Its motorized machine gun battalion preceded the other units and successfully held the bridgehead at the Marne, opposite Chateau Thierry. The second division, in reserve near Montdidier, was sent by motor trucks and other available transport to check the progress of the enemy toward Paris. The division attacked and retook the town and railroad station at Boreches and sturdily held its ground against the enemy's best guard divisions. In the Battle of Below Wood, which followed, our men proved their superiority and gained a strong tactical position, with far greater loss to the enemy than to ourselves. On July 1st, before the second was relieved, it captured the village of Vaux with most splendid precision. Meanwhile our second corps, under Majgen George W. Reed, had been organized for the command of our divisions with the British, which were held back in training areas or assigned to second-line defenses. Five of the ten divisions were withdrawn from the British area in June. Three to relieve divisions in Lorraine and the Vosges and two to the Paris area to join the group of American divisions which stood between the city and any farther advance of the enemy in that direction. The great June-July troop movement from the States was well underway, and, although these troops were to be given some preliminary training before being put into action, their very presence warranted the use of all the older divisions in the confidence that we did not lack reserves. Elements of the 42nd Division were in the line east of Reims against the German offensive of July 15, and held their ground unflinchingly. On the right flank of this offensive four companies of the 28th Division were in position in face of the advancing waves of the German infantry. The 3rd Division was holding the bank of the Marne from the bend east of the mouth of the Sermelin to the west of Misi, opposite Chateau Thierry where a large force of German infantry sought to force a passage under support of powerful artillery concentrations and under cover of smoke screens. A single regiment of the 3rd wrote one of the most brilliant pages in our military annals on this occasion. It prevented the crossing at certain points on its front while, on either flank, the Germans, who had gained a footing, pressed forward. Our men, firing in three directions, met the German attacks with counterattacks at critical points and succeeded in throwing two German divisions into complete confusion, capturing 600 prisoners. The great force of the German Chateau Thierry offensive established the deep Marne salient, but the enemy was taking chances, and the vulnerability of this pocket to attack might be turned to his disadvantage. Seizing this opportunity to support my conviction, Every division with any sort of training was made available for use in a counteroffensive. The place of honor in the thrust toward Soissons on July 18 was given to our first and second divisions in company with chosen French divisions. Without the usual brief warning of a preliminary bombardment, the massed French and American artillery, firing by the map, laid down its rolling barrage at dawn while the infantry began its charge. 
the tactical handling of our troops under these trying conditions was excellent throughout the action. The enemy brought up large numbers of reserves and made a stubborn defense both with machine guns and artillery. But through five days fighting the 1st Division continued to advance until it had gained the heights above Soissons and captured the village of Berzilu SEC. The 2nd Division took Beau Repair Farm and Vierzy in a very rapid advance and reached a position in front of Tigny at the end of its second day. These two divisions captured 7,000 prisoners and over 100 pieces of artillery. The 26th Division, which, with a French division, was under command of our 1st Corps, acted as a pivot of the movement towards Soissons. On the 18th it took the village of Torquay while the 3rd Division was crossing the Marne in pursuit of the retiring enemy. The 26th attacked again on the 21st, and the enemy withdrew past the Chateau thierry Soissons road. The 3rd Division, continuing its progress, took the heights of Mont Saint-Père and the villages of Chartives and Jalgon in the face of both machine gun and artillery fire. On the 24th, after the Germans had fallen back from Trugny and Epitz, our 42nd Division, which had been brought over from the Champagne, relieved the 26th and, fighting its way through the Forêt de Fear, overwhelmed the nest of machine guns in its path. By the 27th it had reached the Orc, whence the 3rd and 4th Divisions were already advancing, while the French divisions with which we were cooperating were moving forward at other points. The 3rd Division had made its advance into Ranchier's Wood on the 29th and was relieved for rest by a brigade of the 32nd. The 42nd and 32nd undertook the task of conquering the heights beyond Sirges, the 42nd capturing Sergi and the 32nd capturing Hill 230, both American divisions joining in the pursuit of the enemy to the vessel. And thus the operation of reducing the salient was finished. Meanwhile the 42nd was relieved by the 4th at Cherry Chartreuve, and the 32nd by the 28th, while the 77th Division took up a position on the vessel. The operations of these divisions on the vessel were under the 3rd Corps, Maj Gen Robert L. Bullard, commanding. Battle of St. Mihiel. With the reduction of the Marne salient we could look forward to the concentration of our divisions in our own zone. In view of the forthcoming operation against the St. Mihiel salient, which had long been planned as our first offensive action on a large scale, the 1st Army was organized on August 10 under my personal command. While American units had held different divisional and corps sectors along the Western Front, there had not been up to this time, for obvious reasons, a distinct American sector. But, in view of the important parts the American forces were now to play, it was necessary to take over a permanent portion of the line. Accordingly, on August 30, the line beginning at Port Sur Seal, east of the Moselle and extending to the west through St. Mihiel, thence north to a point opposite Verdun, was placed under my command. The American sector was afterwards extended across the Meuse to the western edge of the Argonne Forest, and included the 2nd Colonial French, which held the point of the salient, and the 17th French Corps, which occupied the heights above Verdun. The preparation for a complicated operation against the formidable defenses in front of us included the assembling of divisions and of corps and army artillery, transport, aircraft, tanks, ambulances, the location of hospitals, and the molding together of all of the elements of a great modern army with its own railheads, supplied directly by our own service of supply. The concentration for this operation, which was to be a surprise, involved the movement, mostly at night, of approximately 600,000 troops, and required for its success the most careful attention to every detail. Illustration, Photograph Copyright Committee on Public Information The American Commander-in-Chief in the Field Photograph of General John J. Pershing just after he had been Decorated with the Star and Ribbon of the Legion of Honor of France the highest decoration ever awarded an American soldier. General. Pershing was raised to a full generalship soon after his arrival in. France, an honor which has previously been held only by Washington. Grant, Sherman and Sheridan. Illustration, Photograph. Noted American generals. General March is Chief of Staff of the American Army. Lieutenant Generals Liggett and Bullard commanded the 1st and 2nd. Armies respectively. 
and Major Generals Wright and Red are Corps. Commanders. The French were generous in giving us assistance in Corps and Army artillery, with its personnel, and we were confident from the start of our superiority over the enemy in guns of all calibers. Our heavy guns were able to reach Metz and to interfere seriously with German rail movements. The French Independent Air Force was placed under my command which, together with the British bombing squadrons and our air forces, gave us the largest assembly of aviation that had ever been engaged in one operation on the Western Front. From Les Eparges around the nose of the salient at St. Mihiel to the Moselle River the line was roughly 40 miles long and situated on commanding ground greatly strengthened by artificial defenses. Our 1st Corps, 82nd, 90th, 5th, and 2nd Divisions, under command of Major General Hunter Liggett, restrung its right on Pontemousin, with its left joining our 3rd Corps, the 89th, 42nd, and 1st Divisions. Under Major General Joseph T. Dickman, in line to Zivray, were to swing in toward Vignoles on the pivot of the Moselle River for the initial assault. From Zivray to Mully the 2nd Colonial French Corps was in line in the center and our 5th Corps, under command of Major General George H. Cameron, with our 26th Division and a French Division at the western base of the salient, were to attack three difficult hills, Les Eparges, Combres, and Amaranth. Our 1st Corps had in reserve the 78th Division, our 4th Corps the 3rd Division, and our 1st Army the 35th and 91st Divisions, with the 80th and 33rd available. It should be understood that our corps organizations are very elastic, and that we have at no time had permanent assignments of divisions to corps. After four hours artillery preparation, the seven American divisions in the front line advanced at 5 a.m. on September 12th, assisted by a limited number of tanks manned partly by Americans and partly by the French. These divisions, accompanied by groups of wire cutters and others armed with Bangalore torpedoes, went through the successive bands of barbed wire that protected the enemy's front line and support trenches, in irresistible waves on schedule time. Breaking down all defense of an enemy demoralized by the great volume of our artillery fire and our sudden approach out of the fog. Our 1st Corps advanced to Thiaucourt, while our 4th Corps curved back to the southwest through Nonsard. The 2nd Colonial French Corps made the slight advance required of it on very difficult ground, and the 5th Corps took its three ridges and repulsed a counterattack. A rapid march brought reserve regiments of a division of the 5th Corps into Vignoles in the early morning, where it linked up with patrols of our 4th Corps. Closing the salient and forming a new line west of Thiaucourt to Vignoles and beyond Frains and Wovre. At the cost of only 7,000 casualties, mostly light, we had taken 16,000 prisoners and 443 guns, a great quantity of material, released the inhabitants of many villages from enemy domination, and established our lines in a position to threaten Metz. This signal success of the American First Army in its first offensive was of prime importance. The Allies found they had a formidable army to aid them, and the enemy learned finally that he had one to reckon with. Musargon Offensive, First Phase On the day after we had taken the St. Mihiel salient, much of our corps and army artillery which had operated at St. Mihiel, and our divisions in reserve at other points, were already on the move toward the area back of the line between the Meuse River and the western edge of the forest of Argonne. With the exception of St. Mihiel, the old German front line from Switzerland to the east of Reims was still intact. In the general attack all along the line, the operation assigned the American army as the hinge of this Allied offensive was directed toward the important railroad communications of the German armies through Maziers and Sedan. The enemy must hold fast to this part of his lines or the withdrawal of his forces with four years' accumulation of plants and material would be dangerously imperiled. The German army had as yet shown no demoralization and, while the mass of its troops had suffered in morale, its first-class divisions, and notably its machine-gun defense, were exhibiting remarkable tactical efficiency as well as courage. The German general staff was fully aware of the consequences of a success on the Musargon line. Certain that he would do everything in his power to oppose us, the action was planned with as much secrecy as possible and was undertaken with the determination to use all our divisions in forcing decision. 
We expected to draw the best German divisions to our front and to consume them while the enemy was held under grave apprehension lest our attack should break his line, which it was our firm purpose to do. Our right flank was protected by the Meuse, while our left embraced the Argonne forest whose ravines, hills, and elaborate defense screened by dense thickets had been generally considered impregnable. Our order of battle from right to left was the 3rd Corps from the Meuse to Malincourt, with the 33rd, 80th, and 4th Divisions in line, and the 3rd Division as Corps Reserve. The 5th Corps from Malincourt to Vauquois, with 79th, 87th, and 91st Divisions in line, and the 32nd in Corps Reserve. And the 1st Corps, from Vauquois to vienne le chateau with 35th, 28th, and 77th Divisions in line, and the 92nd in Corps Reserve. The Army Reserve consisted of the 1st, 29th, and 82nd Divisions. On the night of September 25th our troops quietly took the place of the French who thinly held the line in this sector which had long been inactive. In the attack which began on the 26th we drove through the barbed wire entanglements and the sea of shell craters across no man's land, mastering the first-line defenses. Continuing on the 27th and 28th, against machine guns and artillery of an increasing number of enemy reserve divisions, we penetrated to a depth of from three to seven miles, and took the village of Montfaucon and its commanding hill and Exermont. Jercourt, Chwesi, Sepsarges, Malincourt, Ivoiry, Epinonville, Charpentry, Vary, and other villages. East of the Meuse one of our divisions, which was with the 2nd Colonial French Corps, captured Marcheville and Reville, giving further protection to the flank of our main body. We had taken 10,000 prisoners, we had gained our point of forcing the battle into the open and were prepared for the enemy's reaction. Which was bound to come as he had good roads and ample railroad facilities for bringing up his artillery and reserves. In the chill rain of dark nights our engineers had to build new roads across spongy, shell-torn areas, repair broken roads beyond no man's land, and build bridges. Our gunners, with no thought of sleep, put their shoulders to wheels and drag ropes to bring their guns through the mire in support of the infantry, now under the increasing fire of the enemy's artillery. Our attack had taken the enemy by surprise, but, quickly recovering himself, he began to fire counterattacks in strong force, supported by heavy bombardments, with large quantities of gas. From September 28 until October 4 we maintained the offensive against patches of woods defended by snipers and continuous lines of machine guns, and pushed forward our guns and transport. Seizing strategical points in preparation for further attacks. Other units with allies. Other divisions attached to the Allied armies were doing their part. It was the fortune of our 2nd Corps, composed of the 27th and 30th Divisions, which had remained with the British, to have a place of honour in cooperation with the Australian Corps, on September 29 and October 1. In the assault on the Hindenburg Line where the St. Quinton Canal passes through a tunnel under a ridge. The 30th Division speedily broke through the main line of defence for all its objectives, while the 27th pushed on impetuously through the main line until some of its elements reached Goey. In the midst of the maze of trenches and shell craters and under crossfire from machine guns the other elements fought desperately against odds. In this and in later actions, from October 6 to October 19, our 2nd Corps captured over 6,000 prisoners and advanced over 13 miles. The spirit and aggressiveness of these divisions have been highly praised by the British Army commander under whom they served. On October 2d to 9th our 2nd and 36th divisions were sent to assist the French in an important attack against the old German positions before Reims. The 2nd conquered the complicated defense works on their front against a persistent defense worthy of the grimmest period of trench warfare and attacked the strongly held wooded hill of Blancmont, which they captured in a second assault sweeping over it with consummate dash and skill. This division then repulsed strong counterattacks before the village and cemetery of St. Etienne and took the town, forcing the Germans to fall back from before Reims and yield positions they had held since September, 1914. On October 9 the 36th Division relieved the 2nd and, in its first experience under fire, withstood very severe artillery bombardment and rapidly took up the pursuit of the enemy, now retiring behind the Aisne. Meuse-Argonne Offensive, Second Phase 
The Allied progress elsewhere cheered the efforts of our men in this crucial contest as the German command threw in more and more first-class troops to stop our advance. We made steady headway in the almost impenetrable and strongly held Argonne Forest, for, despite this reinforcement, it was our army that was doing the driving. Our aircraft was increasing in skill and numbers and forcing the issue, and our infantry and artillery were improving rapidly with each new experience. The replacements fresh from home were put into exhausted divisions with little time for training, but they had the advantage of serving beside men who knew their business and who had almost become veterans overnight. The enemy had taken every advantage of the terrain, which especially favored the defense, by a prodigal use of machine guns manned by highly trained veterans and by using his artillery at short ranges. In the face of such strong frontal positions we should have been unable to accomplish any progress according to previously accepted standards, but I had every confidence in our aggressive tactics and the courage of our troops. On October 4 the attack was renewed all along our front. The 3rd Corps tilting to the left followed the Brulolskunel Road. Our 5th Corps took Jessens while the 1st Corps advanced for over two miles along the irregular valley of the Air River and in the wooded hills of the Argonne that bordered the river, used by the enemy with all his art and weapons of defense. This sort of fighting continued against an enemy striving to hold every foot of ground and whose very strong counterattacks challenged us at every point. On the 7th the 1st Corps captured Chatel Chahiri and continued along the river to Corny. On the east of Meuse sector one of the two divisions cooperating with the French captured Consenvoy and the Halmont Woods. On the 9th the 5th Corps, in its progress up the air, took Flevel, and the 3rd Corps, which had continuous fighting against odds, was working its way through Brulols and Cunel. On the 10th we had cleared the Argonne forest of the enemy. It was now necessary to constitute a second army, and on October 9 the immediate command of the 1st Army was turned over to Lt. Gen. Hunter Liggett. The command of the 2nd Army, whose divisions occupied a sector in the Wovra, was given to Lt. Gen. Robert L. Bullard, who had been commander of the 1st Division and then of the 3rd Corps. Major Gen. Dickman was transferred to the command of the 1st Corps, while the 5th Corps was placed under Major Gen. Charles P. Summerall, who had recently commanded the 1st Division. Major General John L. Hines, who had gone rapidly up from regimental to division commander, was assigned to the 3rd Corps. These four officers had been in France from the early days of the expedition and had learned their lessons in the school of practical warfare. Our constant pressure against the enemy brought day by day more prisoners, mostly survivors from machine gun nests captured in fighting at close quarters. On October 18 there was very fierce fighting in the Corps' woods east of the Meuse and in the Ormont woods. On the 14th the 1st Corps took his tea. Juven, and the 5th Corps, in hand-to-hand -hand encounters, entered the formidable Krimhilda line, where the enemy had hoped to check us indefinitely. Later the 5th Corps penetrated further the Krimhilda line, and the 1st Corps took Champignols and the important town of Grandpre. Our dog defensive was wearing down the enemy, who continued desperately to throw his best troops against us, thus weakening his line in front of our allies and making their advance less difficult. Divisions in Belgium Meanwhile we were not only able to continue the battle, but our 37th and 91st divisions were hastily withdrawn from our front and dispatched to help the French army in Belgium. Detraining in the neighborhood of Ypres, these divisions advanced by rapid stages to the fighting line and were assigned to adjacent French corps. On October 31, in continuation of the Flanders offensive, they attacked and methodically broke down all enemy resistance. On November 3d the 37th had completed its mission in dividing the enemy across the Escot River and firmly established itself along the east bank included in the division zone of action. By a clever flanking movement troops of the 91st Division captured Spittles Boschen, a difficult wood extending across the central part of the division sector, reached the Escot, and penetrated into the town of Audenard. These divisions received high commendation from their corps commanders for their dash and energy. Meuse are gone, last phase. On the 23d the 3rd and 5th Corps pushed northward to the level of Bantheville. While we continued to press forward and throw back the enemy's violent counterattacks with great loss to him, a regrouping of our forces was underway for the final assault. 
Evidences of loss of morale by the enemy gave our men more confidence in attack and more fortitude in enduring the fatigue of incessant effort and the hardships of very inclement weather. With comparatively well-rested divisions, the final advance in the Musargon front was begun on November 1. Our increased artillery force acquitted itself magnificently in support of the advance, and the enemy broke before the determined infantry, which, by its persistent fighting of the past weeks and the dash of this attack, had overcome his will to resist. The Third Corps took Aincreville, Dalkin, and Andavan, and the V Corps took Landry's Eve St. George's and pressed through successive lines of resistance to Bayonville and Chinnery. On the 2d the I Corps joined in the movement, which now became an impetuous onslaught that could not be stayed. On the 3d advance troops surged forward in pursuit, some by motor trucks, while the artillery pressed along the country roads close behind. The I Corps reached Auth and Chitilan Sirbar, the V Corps, Foss and Newart, and the 3rd Corps Halleys, penetrating the enemy's line to a depth of 12 miles. Our large caliber guns had advanced and were skillfully brought into position to fire upon the important lines at Montmedy, Longuian, and Conflans. Our 3rd Corps crossed the Meuse on the 5th and the other corps, in the full confidence that the day was theirs, eagerly cleared the way of machine guns as they swept northward, maintaining complete coordination throughout. On the 6th, a division of the 1st Corps reached a point on the Meuse opposite Sedan, 25 miles from our line of departure. The strategical goal which was our highest hope was gained. We had cut the enemy's main line of communications, and nothing but surrender or an armistice could save his army from complete disaster. In all 40 enemy divisions had been used against us in the Meuse-Argonne battle. Between September 26 and November 6 we took 26,059 prisoners and 468 guns on this front. Our divisions engaged were the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 26th, 28th, 29th, 32nd, 33rd, 35th, 37th, 42nd, 77th, 78th, 79th, 80th, 82nd, 89th, 90th, and 91st. Many of our divisions remained in line for a length of time that required nerves of steel, while others were sent in again after only a few days of rest. The 1st, 5th, 26th, 42nd, 77th, 80th, 89th, and 90th were in the line twice. Although some of the divisions were fighting their first battle, they soon became equal to the best. Operations East of the Meuse On the three days preceding November 10th, the 3rd, the 2nd Colonial, and the 17th French Corps fought a difficult struggle through the Meuse Hills south of Stenay and forced the enemy into the plain. Meanwhile, my plans for further use of the American forces contemplated an advance between the Meuse and the Moselle in the direction of Longwy by the 1st Army, while, at the same time, the 2nd Army should assure the offensive toward the rich coal fields of Brie. These operations were to be followed by an offensive toward Chateau Salins east of the Moselle, thus isolating Metz. Accordingly, attacks on the American front had been ordered and that of the Second Army was in progress on the morning of November 11, when instructions were received that hostilities should cease at 11 o'clock a.m. At this moment the line of the American sector, from right to left, began at Port sur -Seal, thence across the Moselle to Vandiers and through the Wovre to Bezenvox in the foothills of the Meuse. Thence along to the foothills and through the northern edge of the Wovre forests to the Meuse at Mazé, thence along the Meuse connecting with the French under Sedan. There are in Europe altogether, including a regiment and some sanitary units with the Italian army and the organizations at Murmansk, also including those en route from the States, approximately 2,053,347 men, less our losses. Of this total there are in France 1,338,169 combatant troops. Forty divisions have arrived, of which the infantry personnel of ten have been used as replacements, leaving thirty divisions now in France organized into three armies of three corps each. The losses of the Americans up to November 18 are, killed and wounded, 36,145, died of disease, 14,811, deaths unclassified, 2,204, wounded, 179,625, 
prisoners, 2,163, missing, 1,160. We have captured about 41,000 prisoners and 1,400 guns, howitzers and trench mortars. Finally, I pay the supreme tribute to our officers and soldiers of the line. When I think of their heroism, their patience under hardships, their unflinching spirit of offensive action, I am filled with emotion which I am unable to express. Their deeds are immortal, and they have earned the eternal gratitude of our country. Chapter 59 President Wilson's Review of the War On December 2, 1918, just prior to sailing for Europe to take part in the peace conference, President Wilson addressed Congress, reviewing the work of the American people, soldiers, sailors and civilians, in the World War which had been brought to a successful conclusion on November 11. His speech, in part, follows. The year that has elapsed since I last stood before you to fulfill my constitutional duty to give to the Congress from time to time information on the State of the Union has been so crowded with great events, great processes and great results that I cannot hope to give you an adequate picture of its transactions or of the far-reaching changes which have been wrought in the life of our nation and of the world. You have yourselves witnessed these things, as I have. It is too soon to assess them. And we who stand in the midst of them and are part of them are less qualified than men of another generation will be to say what they mean or even what they have been. But some great outstanding facts are unmistakable and constitute in a sense part of the public business with which it is our duty to deal. To state them is to set the stage for the legislative and executive action which must grow out of them and which we have yet to shape and determine. A year ago we had sent 145,918 men overseas. Since then we have sent 1,950,513, an average of 162,542 each month, the number in fact rising in May last to 245,951, in June to 278,760 in July to 307,182 and continuing to reach similar figures in August and September, in August 289, 570 and in September 257,438. No such movement of troops ever took place before, across 3,000 miles of sea, followed by adequate equipment and supplies, and carried safely through extraordinary dangers of attack. Dangers which were alike strange and infinitely difficult to guard against. In all this movement only 758 men were lost by enemy attacks, 630 of whom were upon a single English transport which was sunk near the Orkney Islands. I need not tell you what lay back of this great movement of men and material. It is not invidious to say that back of it lay a supporting organization of the industries of the country and of all its productive activities more complete, more thorough in method and effective in results. More spirited and unanimous in purpose and effort than any other great belligerent had ever been able to effect. We profited greatly by the experience of the nations which had already been engaged for nearly three years in the exigent and exacting business, their every resource and every proficiency taxed to the utmost. We were the pupils. But we learned quickly and acted with a promptness and a readiness of cooperation that justify our great pride that we were able to serve the world with unparalleled energy and quick accomplishment. But it is not the physical scale and executive efficiency of preparation, supply, equipment and dispatch that I would dwell upon, but the metal and quality of the officers and men we sent over and of the sailors who kept the seas. And the spirit of the nation that stood behind them. No soldiers, or sailors, ever proved themselves more quickly ready for the test of battle or acquitted themselves with more splendid courage and achievement when put to the test. Those of us who played some part in directing the great processes by which the war was pushed irresistibly forward to the final triumph may now forget all that and delight our thoughts with the story of what our men did. Their officers understood the grim and exacting task they had undertaken and performed with audacity, efficiency, and unhesitating courage that touched the story of convoy and battle with imperishable distinction at every turn. Whether the enterprise were great or small, from their chiefs, Pershing and Sims, down to the youngest lieutenant. And their men were worthy of them, such men as hardly need to be commanded, 
and go to their terrible adventure blithely and with the quick intelligence of those who know just what it is they would accomplish. I am proud to be the fellow countrymen of men of such stuff and valor. Those of us who stayed at home did our duty, the war could not have been won or the gallant men who fought it given their opportunity to win it otherwise. But for many a long day we shall think ourselves accursed we were not there, and hold our manhoods cheap while any speaks that fought with these at St. Mihiel or Thierry. The memory of those days of triumphant battle will go with these fortunate men to their graves, and each will have his favorite memory. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. What we all thank God for with deepest gratitude is that our men went in force into the line of battle just at the critical moment. And threw their fresh strength into the ranks of freedom in time to turn the whole tide and sweep of the fateful struggle, turn it once for all, so that henceforth it was back, back, back for their enemies, always back, never again forward. After that it was only a scant four months before the commanders of the central empires knew themselves beaten, and now their very empires are in liquidation. And throughout it all how fine the spirit of the nation was. What unity of purpose, what untiring zeal. What elevation of purpose ran through all its splendid display of strength, its untiring accomplishment. I have said that those of us who stayed at home to do the work of organization and supply will always wish that we had been with the men whom we sustained by our labor, but we can never be ashamed. It has been an inspiring thing to be here in the midst of fine men who had turned aside from every private interest of their own and devoted the whole of their trained capacity to the tasks that supplied the sinews of the whole great undertaking. The patriotism, the unselfishness, the thoroughgoing devotion and distinguished capacity that marked their toilsome labors, day after day, month after month, have made them fit mates and comrades of the men in the trenches and on the sea. And not the men here in Washington only. They have but directed the vast achievement. Throughout innumerable factories, upon innumerable farms, in the depths of coal mines and iron mines and copper mines, wherever the stuffs of industry were to be obtained and prepared, in the shipyards, on the railways, at the docks, on the sea. In every labor that was needed to sustain the battle lines men have vied with each other to do their part and do it well. They can look any man at arms in the face, and say, we also strove to win and gave the best that was in us to make our fleets and armies sure of their triumph. And what shall we say of the women, of their instant intelligence, quickening every task that they touched? Their capacity for organization and cooperation, which gave their action discipline and enhanced the effectiveness of everything they attempted, their aptitude at tasks to which they had never before set their hands. Their utter self-sacrificing alike in what they did and in what they gave. Their contribution to the great result is beyond appraisal. They have added a new luster to the annals of American womanhood. The least tribute we can pay them is to make them the equals of men in political rights as they have proved themselves their equals in every field of practical work they have entered, whether for themselves or for their country. These great days of completed achievement would be sadly marred were we to omit that act of justice. Besides the immense practical services they have rendered, the women of the country have been the moving spirits in the systematic economies by which our people have voluntarily assisted to supply the suffering peoples of the world and the armies upon every front with food and everything else that we had that might serve the common cause. The details of such a story can never be fully written, but we carry them at our hearts and thank God that we can say we are the kinsmen of such. And now we are sure of the great triumph for which every sacrifice was made. It has come, come in its completeness. And with the pride and inspiration of these days of achievement quick within us we turn to the tasks of peace again, a peace secure against the violence of irresponsible monarchs and ambitious military coteries and made ready for a new order. For new foundations of justice and fair dealing. We are about to give order and organization to this peace, not only for ourselves, but for the other peoples of the world as well, so far as they will suffer us to serve them. It is international justice that we seek, not domestic safety merely. So far as our domestic affairs are concerned the problem of our return to peace is a problem of economic and industrial readjustment. That problem is less serious for us than it may turn out to be for the nations which have suffered the disarrangements and the losses of war longer than we. Our people, moreover, 
do not wait to be coached and led. They know their own business, are quick and resourceful at every readjustment, definite in purpose and self-reliant in action. Any leading strings we might seek to put them in would speedily become hopelessly tangled because they would pay no attention to them and go their own way. All that we can do as their legislative and executive servants is to mediate the process of change here, there and elsewhere as we may. I have heard much counsel as to the plans that should be formed and personally conducted to a happy consummation. But from no quarter have I seen any general scheme of reconstruction emerge which I thought it likely we could force our spirited businessmen and self-reliant laborers to accept with due pliancy and obedience. While the war lasted we set up many agencies by which to direct the industries of the country in the services it was necessary for them to render, by which to make sure of an abundant supply of the materials needed. By which to check undertakings that could for the time be dispensed with and stimulate those that were most serviceable in war. By which to gain for the purchasing departments of the government a certain control over the prices of essential articles and materials, by which to restrain trade with alien enemies. Make the most of the available shipping and systematize financial transactions, both public and private, so that there would be no unnecessary conflict or confusion, by which, in short, to put every material energy of the country in harness to draw the common load and make of us one team in accomplishment of a great task. But the moment we knew the armistice to have been signed we took the harness off. Raw materials upon which the government had kept its hand for fear there should not be enough for the industries that supplied the armies have been released, and put into the general market again. Great industrial plants whose whole output and machinery had been taken over for the uses of the government have been set free to return to the uses to which they were put before the war. It has not been possible to remove so readily or so quickly the control of foodstuffs and of shipping. Because the world has still to be fed from our granaries and the ships are still needed to send supplies to our men overseas and to bring the men back as fast as the disturbed conditions on the other side of the water permit. But even their restraints are being relaxed as much as possible, and more and more as the weeks go by. Never before have there been agencies in existence in this country which knew so much of the field of supply of labor, and of industry as the War Industries Board, the War Trade Board, the Labor Department. The Food Administration and the Fuel Administration have known since their labors became thoroughly systematized. And they have not been isolated agencies, they have been directed by men which represented the permanent departments of the government and so have been the centers of unified and cooperative action. It has been the policy of the executive, therefore. Since the armistice was assured, which is in effect a complete submission of the enemy, to put the knowledge of these bodies at the disposal of the businessmen of the country and to offer their intelligent mediation at every point and in every matter where it was desired. It is surprising how fast the process of return to a peace footing has moved in the three weeks since the fighting stopped. It promises to outrun any inquiry that may be instituted and any aid that may be offered. It will not be easy to direct it any better than it will direct itself. The American businessman is of quick initiative. I welcome this occasion to announce to the Congress my purpose to join in Paris the representatives of the governments with which we have been associated in the war against the Central Empires for the purpose of discussing with them the main features of the Treaty of Peace. I realize the great inconveniences that will attend my leaving the country, particularly at this time. But the conclusion that it was my paramount duty to go has been forced upon me by considerations which I hope will seem as conclusive to you as they have seemed to me. The Allied governments have accepted the basis of peace which I outlined to the Congress on the 8th of January last, as the Central Empires also have, and very reasonably desire my personal counsel in their interpretation and application. And it is highly desirable that I should give it. In order that the sincere desire of our government to contribute without selfish purpose of any kind to settlements that will be of common benefit to all the nations concerned may be made fully manifest. The peace settlements which are now to be agreed upon are of transcendent importance both to us and to the rest of the world, and I know of no business or interest which should take precedence of them. The gallant men of our armed forces on land and sea have consciously fought for the ideals which they knew to be the ideals of their country, I have sought to express those ideals. They have accepted my statements of them as the substance of their own thought and purpose, 
as the associated governments have accepted them. I owe it to them to see to it, so far as in me lies, that no false or mistaken interpretation is put upon them, and no possible effort omitted to realize them. It is now my duty to play my full part in making good what they offered their life's blood to obtain. I can think of no call to service which could transcend this. May I not hope, gentlemen of the Congress, that in the delicate tasks I shall have to perform on the other side of the sea in my efforts truly and faithfully to interpret the principles and purposes of the country we love. I may have the encouragement and the added strength of your united support. I realize the magnitude and difficulty of the duty I am undertaking. I am poignantly aware of its grave responsibilities. I am the servant of the nation. I can have no private thought or purpose of my own in performing such an errand. I go to give the best that is in me to the common settlements which I must now assist in arriving at in conference with the other working heads of the associated governments. I shall count upon your friendly countenance and encouragement. I shall not be inaccessible. The cables and the wireless will render me available for any counselor service you may desire of me, and I shall be happy in the thought that I am constantly in touch with the weighty matters of domestic policy with which we shall have to deal. I shall make my absence as brief as possible and shall hope to return with the happy assurance that it has been possible to translate into action the great ideals for which America has striven. Illustration, Photograph Copyright Harris and Ewing Woodrow Wilson President of the United States during the whole course of the war and Commander-in-Chief of its Army and Navy On November 11, 1918, he Signalized the end of the war in a proclamation in which he said, My Fellow countrymen, the armistice was signed this morning. Everything For which America fought has been accomplished. Illustration, Photograph Copyright International Film Service When it was over, over there. Victorious American troops arriving at New York after the signing of The Armistice Summarized Chronology of the War June 28 Assassination of Archduke Francis Ferdinand, heir to throne of Austria-Hungary, and his wife at Sarajevo, Bosnia July 28. Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. 29. Russian mobilization ordered. August. 1. Germany declares war on Russia. 1. France orders mobilization. 2. Germany demands free passage through Belgium. 3. Germany declares war on France. 3. Belgium rejects Germany's demand. 4. Germany at war with Belgium. Troops under General von Kluck cross border. Halted at Liege. 4. Great Britain at war with Germany. Kitchener becomes Secretary of War. 5. President Wilson tenders good offices of United States in interests of peace. 6. Austria Hungary at war with Russia. 7. French forces invade Alsace. Gen. Joffrey in supreme command of French army. 7. Montenegro at war with Austria. 7. Great Britain's expeditionary force lands at Ostend, Calais and Dunkirk. 8. British seize German Togoland. 8. Serbia at war with Germany. 8. Portugal announces readiness to stand by alliance with England. 11. German cruisers Goben and Breslau enter Dardanelles and are purchased by Turkey. 12. Great Britain at war with Austria-Hungary. 12. Montenegro at war with Germany. 17. Belgian capital removed from Brussels to Antwerp. 19. Canadian Parliament authorizes raising expeditionary force. 20. Germans occupy Brussels. 23. Japan at war with Germany. Begins attack on Tsingtao. 24. Germans enter France near Lille. 25. Austria at war with Japan. 26. Louvain sacked and burned by Germans. Viviani becomes Premier of France. 28. 
British fleet sinks three German cruisers and two destroyers off Heligoland. 28. Austria declares war on Belgium. 29. Russians invest Königsberg, East Prussia. New Zealanders seize German Samoa. 30. Amiens occupied by Germans. 31. Russian army of invasion in East Prussia defeated at Tannenberg by Germans under von Hindenburg. 31. St. Petersburg changed to Petrograd by imperial decree. September. 3. Paris placed in state of siege, government transferred to Bordeaux. 3. Lemberg, Galicia, occupied by Russians. 4. Germans occupy Reims. 6 to 10. The Battle of Marne. Von Kluck is beaten by General Joffrey, and the German army retreats from Paris to the Soissons line. 10. Emden, German cruiser, carries out raids in Bay of Bengal. 14. French reoccupy Amiens and Reims. 19. British forces begin operations in southwest Africa. 20. Reims Cathedral shelled by Germans. 24. Allies occupy Peron. 25. Australian seize German New Guinea. 28. Anglo French forces invade German colony of Cameron. 29. Antwerp bombardment begins. October. 2. British Admiralty announces intention to mine North Sea areas. 6. Japan seizes Marshall Islands in Pacific. 9. Antwerp surrenders to Germans. Government removed to Ostend. 13. British occupy Ypres. 14. Canadian Expeditionary Force of 32,000 men lands at Plymouth. 15. Germans occupy Ostend. Belgian government removed to Havre, France. November. 1. Monmouth and Good Hope, British cruisers, are sunk by German squadron off Chile under command of Admiral von Spee. 5. Great Britain and France declare war on Turkey. 5. Cyprus annexed by Great Britain. 7. German garrison of Tsingtao surrenders to Japanese. 9. Emden, German cruiser, which had carried out raiding operations for two months, is destroyed by Australian cruiser Sydney off the Cocos Islands, southwest of Java. 16. Prohibition of sale of intoxicants in Russia enforced. 27. Chernowitz, capital of Bukowina, captured by Russians. December. 2. Belgrade occupied by Austrians. 3. Krakow bombarded by Russians. 8. Off the Falkland Isles, British squadron under command of Rear Admiral Steady, sinks three of the German cruisers which had destroyed the Good Hope and Monmouth on November 1. The Dresden escapes. 14. Austrians evacuate Belgrade. 16. German squadron bombards Hartlepool, Scarborough and Whitby on east coast of England. 23. Siege of Krakow raised. Russians retire. January. 24. British fleet puts to flight a German squadron in North Sea and sinks the battle cruiser Blucher. 28. American bark, William P. Fry, sunk by German cruiser in South Atlantic. February. 10. Russians defeated by Germans in Battle of Masserian Lakes. 18. German submarine blockade of British Isles begins. 25. Allied fleet destroys outer forts of Dardanelles. March. 2. Allied troops land at Cumcale, on Asiatic side of Dardanelles. 10. British take Neuve Chapelle in Flanders battle. 14. Dresden, German raiding cruiser, is sunk by British squadron off the Chilean coast. 22. Austrian fortress of PRZMYSL surrenders to Russians. April. 22. Poison gas first used by Germans in attack on Canadians at Ypres, Belgium. May. 1. American steamer Gulflight torpedoed off Scilly Isles by German submarine, three lives lost. 
2. Dot, British South Africa troops under General Bota capture Odenbing, German South West Africa. 7. Dot, Germans capture Libya, Russian Baltic port. 7. Lusitania, Cunard liner, sunk by German submarine off Kinsale Head, Irish coast, with loss of 1152 lives, 102 Americans. 23. Dot, Italy declares war on Austria-Hungary and begins invasion on a 60-mile front. 24. American steamer Nebraskan torpedoed by German submarine off Irish coast, but reaches Liverpool in safety. 31. Dot, German zeppelins bombard suburbs of London. June. 1. Dot, Germany apologizes for attack on Gulf Light and offers reparation. 3. Austrians recapture PRZMYSL. 3. Dot, British forces operating on Tigris capture Cut Elamara. 4 to 6. Dot, German aircraft bombs English towns. 7. Dot, Brian, U.S. Secretary of State, resigns. 15. Dot, Allied aircraft bombs Karlsruhe, Baden, in retaliation. 22. Lemberg recaptured by Austrians. 26. Dot, Montenegrins enter Scutari, Albania. July. 9. Dot, German Southwest Africa surrenders to British South African troops under General Bota. 25. American steamer, Lelana, Archangel to Belfast with flax, torpedoed off Scotland. 31. Dot, Baden bombarded by French aircraft. August. 5. Dot, Warsaw captured by Germans. 6. Dot, Ivangorod occupied by Austrians. 6. Gallipoli Peninsula campaign enters a second stage with the debarkation of a new force of British troops in Suvla Bay, on the west of the peninsula. 8. Dot, Russians defeat German fleet of nine battleships and twelve cruisers at entrance of Gulf of Riga. 19. Arabic, White Star Liner, sunk by submarine off Fastnet, 44 lives lost, 2 Americans. 25. Dot, Brest Litovsk, Russian fortress, captured by Austro Germans. 28. Dot, Italians reach Sima Sista, northeast of Trent. 30. British submarine attacks Constantinople and damages the Galata Bridge. 31. Dot, Lutsk, Russian fortress, captured by Austrians. September. 2. Dot, Grodna, Russian fortress, occupied by Germans. 6. Dot, Tsar Nicholas of Russia assumes command of Russian armies. Grand Duke Nicholas is transferred to the Caucasus. 15. Dot, Pinsk occupied by Germans. 18. Dot, Vilna evacuated by Russia. 24. Dot, Lutsk recaptured by Russians. 25. Dot, Allies open offensive on Western Front and occupy Lens. 27. Dot, Lutsk again falls to Germans. October. 5. Dot, Greece becomes political storm center. Franco-British force lands at Salonika and Greek ministry resigns. 9. Dot, Belgrade again occupied by Austro-Germans. 11. Dot, Zamis, new Greek premier, announces policy of armed neutrality. 12. Edith Cavell, English nurse, shot by Germans for aiding British prisoners to escape from Belgium. 13. Dot, London bombarded by Zeppelins, 55 persons killed, 114 injured. 14. Dot, Bulgaria at war with Serbia. 14. Italians capture Pregasina, on the Trentino frontier. 15. Dot, Great Britain declares war on Bulgaria. 17. Dot, France at war with Bulgaria. 18. Dot, Bulgarians cut the Nish Salonika Railroad at Franja. 19. Dot, Italy and Russia at war with Bulgaria. 22. Uskub occupied by Bulgarians. 28. Dot, Pirat captured by Bulgarians. 29. Dot, Brian becomes Premier of France, succeeding Viviani. November. 5. Dot, Nish, Serbian war capital, captured by Bulgarians. 9. Dot, Ancona, Italian liner, torpedoed in Mediterranean. 17. 
Anglo-French War Council holds first meeting in Paris. 20. Nova Baser occupied by German troops. 22. Tessaphon, near Baghdad, captured by British forces in Asia Minor. 23. Italians drive Austrians from positions on Carso Plateau. 24. Serbian government transferred to Scutari, Albania. December. 1. British Mesopotamian forces retire to Kut Elamara. 2. Monastir evacuated by Serbians. 4. Henry Ford, with large party of peace advocates, sails for Europe on chartered steamer Oscar II, with the object of ending the war. 13. Serbia in hands of enemy, Allied forces abandoning last positions and retiring across Greek frontier. 15. Gen. Sir Douglas Haig succeeds Field Marshal Sir John French as Commander-in-Chief of British Forces in France. 20. Dardanelles expedition ends, British troops begin withdrawal from positions on Suvla Bay and Gallipoli Peninsula. 22. Henry Ford leaves his peace party at Christiania and returns to the United States. January. 11. Greek island of Corfu occupied by French. 13. Sedinj, capital of Montenegro, occupied by Austrians. 23. Scutari, Albania, taken by Austrians. 29-31. German zeppelins bomb Paris and towns in England. February. 1. Appam, British liner, is brought into Norfolk, Virginia, by German prize crew. 10. British conscription law goes into effect. 16. Erzurum, in Turkish Armenia, captured by Russians under Grand Duke Nicholas. 19. Cameron, German colony in Africa, conquered by British forces. 21. Battle of Verdun begins. Germans take Haumont. 25. Fort Duaumont falls to Germans in Verdun battle. 27. Durazzo, Albania, occupied by Austrians. March. 5. Mo, German raider, reaches home port after a cruise of several months. 9. Germany declares war on Portugal on the latter's refusal to give up seized ships. 15. Austria-Hungary at war with Portugal. 24. Sussex, French cross-channel steamer, with many Americans aboard, sunk by submarine off Dieppe. No Americans lost. 31. Melancourt taken by Germans in Verdun battle. April. 18. Trebizond, Turkish Black Sea port, captured by Russians. 19. President Wilson publicly warns Germany not to pursue submarine policy. 20. Russian troops landed at Marseilles for service on French front. 24. Irish rebellion begins in Dublin. Republic declared. Patrick Pierce announced as first president. 29. British force of 9,000 men, under Gen. Townsend, besieged in Kut Elamara, surrenders to Turks. 30. Irish rebellion ends with unconditional surrender of Pierce and other leaders, who are tried by court martial and executed. May. 8. Kimrick, White Star Liner, torpedoed off Irish coast. 14. Italian positions penetrated by Austrians. 15. Vimy Ridge gained by British. 26. Bulgarians invade Greece and occupy forts on the Struma. 31. Jutland naval battle, British and German fleets engaged, heavy losses on both sides. June. 5. Kitchener, British Secretary of War, loses his life when the cruiser Hampshire, on which he was voyaging to Russia, is sunk off the Orkney Islands, Scotland. 6. Germans capture Fort Vox in Verdun attack. 8. Lutsk, Russian fortress, recaptured from Germans. 17. Chernowitz, capital of Bukowina, occupied by Russians. 21. Allies demand Greek demobilization. 27. King Constantine orders demobilization of Greek army. 28. Italian storm Monte Trapola, 
in the Trentino district. July. 1. British and French attack north and south of the Somme. 9. Deutschland, German submarine freight boat, lands at Baltimore, Maryland. 14. British penetrate German second line, using cavalry. 15. Longueville captured by British. 25. Pozières occupied by British. 30. British and French advance between Delville Wood and the Somme. August. 3. French recapture Fleury. 9. Italians enter Gorizia. 10. Stanislaw occupied by Russians. 25. Kavala, Greek seaport town, taken by Bulgarians. 27. Romania declares war on Austria Hungary. 28. Italy at war with Germany. 28. Germany at war with Romania. 30. Romanians advance into Transylvania. 31. Bulgaria at war with Romania. Turkey at war with Romania. September. 2. Bulgarian forces invade Romania along the Dobruja frontier. 13. Italians defeat Austrians on the Carso. 15. British capture Fleurs, Corselet, and other German positions on Western Front, using tanks. 26. Comles and Thiepel captured by British and French. 29. Romanians begin retreat from Transylvania. October. 24. Fort Duomont recaptured by French. November. 1. Deutschland, German merchant submarine, arrives at New London, Connecticut, on second voyage. 2. Fort Vaux evacuated by Germans. 7. Woodrow Wilson re-elected President of the United States. 13. British advance along the anchor. 19. Monastir evacuated by Bulgarians and Germans. 21. Britannic, mammoth British hospital ship, sunk by mine in Aegean Sea. 22. Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria-Hungary, dies. Succeeded by Charles I. 23. German warships bombard English coast. 28. Romanian government is transferred to Jassy. 29. Minuasca, Atlantic transport liner, sunk by mine in Mediterranean. December. 1. Allied troops enter Athens to insist upon surrender of Greek arms and munitions. 6. Bucharest, capital of Romania, captured by Austro Germans. 7. David Lloyd George succeeds Asquith as Premier of England. 15. French complete recapture of ground taken by Germans in Verdun battle. 18. President Wilson makes peace overtures to belligerents. 26. Germany replies to President's note and suggests a peace conference. 30. French government on behalf of Entente Allies replies to President Wilson's note and refuses to discuss peace till Germany agrees to give restitution, reparation and guarantees. January. 1. Turkey declares its independence of suzerainty of European powers. 1. Ivernia, Cunard liner, is sunk in Mediterranean. 22. President Wilson suggests to the belligerents a peace without victory. 31. Germany announces intention of sinking all vessels in war zone around British Isles. February. 3. United States severs diplomatic relations with Germany. Count von Bernstorff is handed his passports. 7. California, anchor liner, is sunk off Irish coast. 13. Afric, White Star Liner, sunk by submarine. 17. British troops on the anchor capture German positions. 25. Laconia, Cunard Liner, sunk off Irish coast. 26. Cut Elamara recaptured from Turks by new British Mesopotamian expedition under command of General Sir Stanley Maud. 28. United States government makes public a communication from Germany to Mexico proposing an alliance, and offering as a reward the return of Mexico's lost territory in Texas, New Mexico and Arizona. 
28. Submarine campaign of Germans results in the sinking of 134 vessels during February. March. 3. British advance on Bapaum. 3. Mexico denies having received an offer from Germany suggesting an alliance. 8. Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin dies. 10. Russian Tsar suspends sittings of the Duma. 11. Baghdad captured by British forces under General Maud. 11. Revolutionary movement starts in Petrograd. 14. China breaks with Germany. 15. Tsar Nicholas abdicates. Prince Lvov heads new cabinet. 17. Bapaum falls to British. Roy and Lassigny occupied by French. 18. Peron, Chalns, Nestle and Noyen evacuated by Germans, who retire on an 85-mile front. 18. City of Memphis, Illinois, and Vigilancia, American ships, torpedoed. 19. Alexander Ribot becomes French Premier, succeeding Bryan. 21. Hilton, American ship, bound from Philadelphia to Rotterdam, sunk without warning, 21 men lost. 26 to 31. Dot, British advance on Cambrai. April. 1. Aztec, American armed ship, sunk in submarine zone. 5. Dot, Missourian, American steamer, sunk in Mediterranean. 6. Dot, United States declares war on Germany. 7. Dot, Cuba and Panama at war with Germany. 8. Dot, Austria Hungary breaks with United States. 9. Germans retreat before British on long front. 9. Bolivia breaks with Germany. 13. Vimy, Givinci, Balliol and positions about Lens taken by Canadians. 20. Turkey breaks with United States. May. 9. Liberia breaks with Germany. 11. Russian Council of Workmen's and Soldiers Delegates demands peace conference. 15. General Pétain succeeds General Nivelle as Commander-in-Chief of French Armies. General Foch is appointed Chief of Staff. 16. Bullcourt captured by British in the Arras Battles. 17. Honduras breaks with Germany. 18. Conscription Bill signed by President Wilson. 19. Nicaragua breaks with Germany. 22-26. Italians advance on the Carso. June. 4. Senator Root arrives in Russia at head of commission appointed by President. 5. Registration day for new draft army in United States. 7. Messina's Witchsheet Ridge in English hands. 8. Gen. Pershing, commander in chief of American Expeditionary Force, arrives in England en route to France. 18. Haiti breaks with Germany. July. 1. Russians begin offensive in Galicia, Kerensky, Minister of War, leading in person. 3. American Expeditionary Force arrives in France. 6. Canadian House of Commons passes Compulsory Military Service Bill. 12. King Constantine of Greece abdicates in favor of his second son, Alexander. 14. Beth Mann, Holweg, German Chancellor, resigns, succeeded by Dr. George Michaelis. 16. 23. Retreat of Russians on a front of 155 miles. 20. Alexander Kerensky becomes Russian Premier, succeeding Lvov. 20. Drawing of draft numbers for American conscript army begins. 22. Siam at war with Germany and Austria. 24. Austro Germans retake Stanislaw. 31. Franco British attack penetrates German lines on a 20 mile front. August. 1. Pope Benedict XV makes plea for peace on a basis of no annexation, no indemnity. 3. Chernowitz captured by Austro Germans. 7. Liberia at war with Germany. 8. Canadian Conscription Bill passes its third reading in Senate. 14. 
China at war with Germany and Austria-Hungary. 15. Street Quinton Cathedral destroyed by Germans. 15. Canadian troops capture Hill 70, dominating Lens. 19. Italians cross the Isonzo and take Austrian positions. 28. Pope Benedict's peace plea rejected by President Wilson. September. 3. Riga captured by Germans. 5. New American National Army begins to assemble in the different cantonments. 7. Miniha, Atlantic transport liner, sunk off Irish coast. 12. Argentina dismisses von Luxburg German minister, on charges of improper conduct made public by United States government. 14. Paul Painlev becomes French premier, succeeding Rabot. 16. Russia proclaimed a republic by Kerensky. 20. Costa Rica breaks with Germany. 21. General Tasker H. Bliss named Chief of Staff of the United States Army. 25. Geimer, famous French flyer, killed. 26. Zonnebeek, Polygon Wood and Tower Hamlets, east of Ypres, taken by British. 28. William D. Haywood, Secretary, and 100 members of the Industrial Workers of the World Arrested for Sedition. 29. Turkish Mesopotamian Army, under Ahmed Bey, captured by British. October. 6. Peru and Uruguay break with Germany. 9. Polkapel and other German positions captured in Franco-British attack. 12-16. Ezel and Dago, Russian islands in Gulf of Riga, captured by Germans. 17. Antilles, American transport, westbound from France, sunk by submarine, 67 lost. 18. Moon Island, in the Gulf of Riga, taken by Germans. 23. American troops in France fire their first shot in trench warfare. 23. French advance northeast of Soissons. 24. Austro Germans begin great offensive on Italian positions. 25. Italians retreat across the Isonzo and evacuate the Bainciza Plateau. 26. Brazil at war with Germany. 27. Gorizia recaptured by Austro Germans. 30. Michaelis, German Chancellor, resigns, succeeded by Count George F. von Hertling. 31. Italians retreat to the Tagliamento. 31. Beersheba, in Palestine, occupied by British. November. 1. Germans abandon position on Chemin de Dames. 3. Americans in trenches suffer 20 casualties in German attacks. 5. Italians abandon Tagliamento line and retire on a 93 mile front in the Carnic Alps. 6. Passchendaele captured by Canadians. 6. British Mesopotamian forces reach Tekrit, 100 miles northwest of Baghdad. 7. The Russian Bolsheviki, led by Lenin and Trotsky, seize Petrograd and depose Kerensky. 8. General Diaz succeeds General Cadorna as commander in chief of Italian armies. 9. Italians retreat to the Pieve. 10. Lenin becomes Premier of Russia, succeeding Kerensky. 15. Georges Clemenceau becomes Premier of France, succeeding Painlev. 18. Major General Maud, captor of Baghdad, dies in Mesopotamia. 21. Rydcourt, Flaskiers, Havrincourt, Marcoing, and other German positions captured by British. 23. Italians repulse Germans on the whole front from the Asiago Plateau to the Brenta River. 24. Cambrai menaced by British, who approach within three miles, capturing Burlan Wood. December. 1. German East Africa reported completely conquered. 1. Allies Supreme War Council, representing the United States, France, Great Britain and Italy, holds first meeting at Versailles. 3. Russian Bolsheviki arrange armistice with Germans. 5. British retire from Bourlon Wood, Grain Court and other positions west of Cambrai. 
6. Jacob Jones, American destroyer, sunk by submarine in European waters. 6. Steamer Mont Blanc, loaded with munitions, explodes in collision with the Imo in Halifax Harbor, 1,500 persons are killed. 7. Finland declares independence. 8. Jerusalem, held by the Turks for 673 years, surrenders to British, under General Allenby. 8. Ecuador breaks with Germany. 10. Panama at war with Austria-Hungary. 11. United States at war with Austria-Hungary. 15. Armistice signed between Germany and Russia at Brest-Litovsk. 17. Coalition government of Sir Robert Borden is returned and conscription confirmed in Canada. January. 14. Premier Clemenceau orders arrest of former Premier Kalos on high treason charge. 19. American troops take over sector northwest of Toul. 29. Italians capture Monte di Valbel. February. 1. Argentine Minister of War recalls military attaches from Berlin and Vienna. 6. Tuscania, American transport, torpedoed off coast of Ireland, 101 lost. 22. American troops in Chemin de Dame sector. 26. British hospital ship, Glenart Castle, torpedoed. 27. Japan proposes joint military operations with allies in Siberia. March. 1. Americans gain signal victory in salient north of Toul. 3. Peace treaty between Bolshevik government of Russia and the Central Powers signed at Brest-Litovsk. 4. Treaty signed between Germany and Finland. 5. Romania signs preliminary treaty of peace with Central Powers. 9. Russian capital moved from Petrograd to Moscow. 14. Russo-German peace treaty ratified by all Russian Congress of Soviets at Moscow. 20. President Wilson orders all Holland ships in American ports taken over. 21. Germans begin great drive on 50-mile front from Arras to Lafayre. Bombardment of Paris by German long-range gun from a distance of 76 miles. 24. Peron, Ham and Chani evacuated by Allies. 25. Bapalm and Nessel occupied by Germans. 29. General Foch chosen commander-in-chief of all Allied forces. April. 5. Japanese forces landed at Vladivostok. 9. Second German drive begun in Flanders. 10. First German drive halted before Amiens after maximum advance of 35 miles. 14. United States Senator Stone, of Missouri, Chairman of Committee on Foreign Relations, dies. 15. Second German drive halted before Ypres, after maximum advance of 10 miles. 16. Buelo Pasha, Levantine resident in Paris executed for treason. 21. Guatemala at war with Germany. 22. Baron von Richthofen, Premier German flyer, killed. 23. British naval forces raid Zeebrug in Belgium, German submarine base, and block channel. May. 7. Nicaragua at war with Germany and her allies. 19. Major Raoul Lufberry, famous American aviator, killed. 24. Costa Rica at war with Germany and Austria Hungary. 27. Third German drive begins or Ain Marne front of 30 miles between Soissons and Reims. 28. Germans sweep on beyond the Chemin de Dames and cross the vessel at Fizzams. 28. Cantigny taken by Americans in local attack. 29. Soissons evacuated by French. 31. Marne River crossed by Germans, who reach Chateau Thierry, 40 miles from Paris. 31. President Lincoln, American transport, sunk. June. 2. Schooner Edward H. Cole torpedoed by submarine off American coast. 3 6. 
American Marines and regulars check advance of Germans at Chateau Thierry and Neuilly after maximum advance of Germans of 32 miles. Beginning of American cooperation on major scale. 9 to 14. Dot, German drive on Neue Montadier front. Maximum advance, 5 miles. 15 to 24. Dot, Austrian drive on Italian front ends in complete failure. 30. Dot, American troops in France, in all departments of service, number 1,019,115. July. 1. Dot, Vox taken by Americans. 3. Dot, Muhammad V, Sultan of Turkey, dies. 10. Dot, Czechoslovaks, aided by allies, take control of a long stretch of the Trans-Siberian Railway. 12. Dot, Barat, Austrian base in Albania, captured by Italians. 15. Dot, Haiti at war with Germany. 15. Stonewall defense of Chateau Thierry blocks new German drive on Paris. 16. Dot, Nicholas Romanov, ex-Tsar of Russia, executed at Ekaterinburg. 17. Dot, Lieutenant. Quinton Roosevelt, youngest son of ex-President Roosevelt, killed in aerial battle near Chateau Thierry. 18. Dot, French and Americans begin counter-offensive on Marnain front. 19. Dot, San Diego, United States cruiser, sunk off Fire Island. 20. Carpathia, Cunard liner, used as transport torpedoed off Irish coast. It was the Carpathia that saved most of the survivors of the Titanic in April, 1912. 20.00, Justitia, giant liner used as troopship, is sunk off Irish coast. 21. German submarine sinks three barges off Cape Cod. 23.00, French take Alchi Le Chateau and drive the Germans back 10 miles between the Aisne and the Marne. 30. Dot, Allies astride the Orc, Germans in full retreat to the vessel. August. 1. Sergeant Joyce Kilmer. American poet and critic, aged 31, dies in battle. 2. Dot, French troops recapture Soissons. 3. President Wilson announces new policy regarding Russia and agrees to cooperate with Great Britain, France, and Japan in sending forces to Murmansk. Archangel and Vladivostok. 3. Allies sweep on between Soissons and Reims, driving the enemy from his base at Fizzums and capturing the entire Aisne vessel front. 7. Franco-American troops cross the vessel. 8. New Allied drive begun by Field Marshal Haig in Picardy, penetrating enemy front 14 miles. 10. Montdidier recaptured. 13. Lassigny Massif taken by French. 15. Dot, Canadians capture Damery and Parvillers, northwest of Roy. 29. Noyen and Bapaume fall in new Allied advance. September. 1. Dot, Australians take Peron. 1. Dot, Americans fight for the first time on Belgian soil and capture Vormazil. 11. Germans are driven back to the Hindenburg Line which they held in November, 1917. 12. Dot, registration day for new draft army of men between 18 and 45 in the United States. 13. Dot, Americans begin vigorous offense in St. Mihiel sector on 40-mile front. 14. Dot, St. Mihiel recaptured from Germans. General Pershing announces entire St. Mihiel salient erased liberating more than 150 square miles of French territory which had been in German hands since 1914. 20. Nazareth occupied by British forces in Palestine under General Allenby. 23. Dot, Bulgarian armies flee before combined attacks of British, Greek, Serbian, Italian and French. 25. Dot, British take 40,000 prisoners in Palestine offensive. 26. Stromnitsa, Bulgaria, occupied by Allies. 27. Dot, Franco Americans in drive from Reims to Verdun take 30,000 prisoners. 28. Dot, Belgians attack enemy from Ypres to North Sea, gaining 4 miles. 29. Bulgaria surrenders to General Diaspory, the Allied commander. 30. Dot, British Belgian advance reaches rulers. 
October. 1. Street Quinton, cornerstone of Hindenburg Line, captured. 1. Damascus occupied by British in Palestine campaign. 2. Lens evacuated by Germans. 3. Albania cleared of Austrians by Italians. 4. Ferdinand, King of Bulgaria, abdicates, Boris succeeds. 5. Prince Maximilian new German Chancellor, pleads with President Wilson to ask allies for armistice. 7. Berioback taken by French. 8. President Wilson asks whether German Chancellor speaks for people or warlords. 9. Cambrai in Allied hands. 10. Leinster, passenger steamer, sunk in Irish Channel by submarine, 480 lives lost. Final German atrocity at sea. 11. Americans advance through Argonne Forest. 12. German Foreign Secretary, Solf, says plea for armistice is made in name of German people, agrees to evacuate all foreign soil. 12. Nish, in Serbia, occupied by Allies. 13. Leon and Lafur abandoned by Germans. 13. Grand Prix captured by Americans after four days' battle. 14. President Wilson refers Germans to General Foch for armistice terms. 16. Lille entered by British patrols. 17. Ostend, German submarine base, taken by land and sea forces. 17. Douai falls to Allies. 19. Bruges and Zeebrug taken by Belgians and British. 25. Beginning of terrific Italian drive which nets 50,000 prisoners in five days. 31. Turkey surrenders, armistice takes effect at noon, conditions include free passage of Dardanelles. November. 1. Clary Le Grand captured by American troops of First Army. 3. Americans sweep ahead on 50 mile front above Verdun, enemy in full retreat. 3. Official reports announce capture of 362,350 Germans since July 15. 3. Austria surrenders, signing armistice with Italy at 3 p.m., after 500,000 prisoners had been taken. 4. Americans advance beyond Stine and strike at Sedan. 7. American Rainbow Division and parts of 1st Division enter suburbs of Sedan. 8. Heights south of Sedan seized by Americans. 9. Mobage captured by Allies. 10. Canadians take Mons in irresistible advance. 11. Germany surrenders, armistice takes effect at 11 a.m., American flag hoisted on Sedan front.